the future of kids coding. Sounds cool, right? Kids coding? Because it is. And I'm going to show you some of the things that they create. So, you know, five years ago, I was sitting with my son, and uh, he wanted to learn some programming. And I was trying to teach him how to code. And uh, at that time, he was in the sixth grade. Right now, he's a junior in high school, just like most of you here in the audience. And he had heard that Python was a cool programming language, and uh, he wanted to learn that. So we were sitting there on a computer, and uh, we were trying to understand the syntax, and we were trying to understand some of the things that you need to do to build a program. And within about five minutes, he was getting bored. It was getting a little too tough, and uh, he said, Dad, is this going to take long? I mean, I saw all the usual signs of boredom and impatience, right? And then uh, he said, uh, I want to go back and do something I'm doing on Minecraft. And so, you know, he was a fifth or sixth grader, and that's what was popular at that time. And that's how it's been whenever I try to teach programming to either of my kids. It seems as if we're trying really hard to teach them something, and they don't really want to learn that because it's not fun. Now, why is that? Uh, programming language is not something that's uh, really simple for kids to learn. Uh, that's because, you know, programming is the way that you communicate with computers. And uh, what happens is that, you know, it has to be really precise and formal. There's, uh, there's keywords and a syntax. And by the time kids try to understand all of that, they get completely bored. And if you really want to uh, teach them programming, you have to make it really easy. Now, when I look back at myself at around the same age, when I was in the sixth or seventh grade in India, uh, my dad picked up uh, one of these gizmos for me. Uh, it was a souped up scientific calculator, but it had a programming language built in on it. And that programming language was basic. Unlike most of you here in the audience, at that time, I didn't have a Game Boy or a, a PlayStation or a, you know, three TVs at home and you know, iPads and everything, right? So this was my only entertainment option. So I tinkered around and I played with it and I learned how to program. But you know, if I ask my kids to learn this way, I mean, they will completely get bored and you know, they'll move on. That's one of the reasons my co-founders and I uh, started Tinker. Tinker is a company where our mission is to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to learn coding. So we want to make programming so easy and fun that everyone, uh, just like you, have already had the opportunity to learn to code. We've had some success with this, and I'm going to share um, all of the things that we've done and all of the programs that kids have built and how we've managed to do that. We are used in more than uh, you know, thousands of schools and millions of students have uh, started their programming with Tinker. So what we do is drag and drop coding, right? So instead of uh, a lot of syntax, we have visual blocks. So when kids want to program using Tinker, they just connect these blocks like Lego blocks, and then that's the program. There are a number of companies who have already done this, so we're not the first ones doing visual programming. Uh, there's uh, Scratch from MIT, uh, there's Alice um, from Carnegie Mellon if you want to build 3D worlds. Uh, there's also a program called Kodu where you can actually program on the Xbox, and that's from Microsoft Labs. Uh, we are inspired by all of those visual programs. Uh, but what we focused on is to go after the teaching aspects rather than just a programming language. And I'll explain what that means. Before I go ahead, let me ask you a question. How many of you can code? Can I have a... Show of hands from the audience. Okay. I do see several hands, but I have to say not nearly enough. Right? So the goal that we have from Tinker is to make sure that every one of you have had the opportunity to learn to code. I wanted to also talk to you about why coding is important, right? I mean, as we've seen, you know, technology evolves really fast, and uh, you know, if you see the last 50 years. And if you look at any field, whether it's communication or whether it's uh, medicine uh, or even farming, you will see that technology has been used everywhere to improve the field. You know, all of us use spreadsheets and all of us use word processors these days, right? But uh, who knew 30 years ago that, you know, if I'd come and said that, hey, all, everyone has to learn how to use a spreadsheet, you know, I'd, I'd have been laughed at because 
Uh, that's how it was, right? So things change really fast. So I firmly believe that coding is a skill that's required for the future, and it is really important for all of you to learn how to code. So that's uh, what we do at Tinker, and I want to now share some of the kids' creations using Tinker. Let's start from uh, you know, younger kids in the third and fourth grade. These are some of the examples that elementary school kids, middle school kids, and high school kids have built. Now, we did a lot of uh, trials uh, of Tinker in the Palo Alto School District, and uh, we're really gracious uh, that the teachers allowed us to do that. Uh, so the kids gave a lot of feedback. And this particular example uh, with the sun and the earth and the moon was an example that was created right here in Barron Park Elementary. So there's a lunchtime Tinker coding club there, and one of the afternoons we went there and we posed a little challenge. Can anybody uh, make this solar system work? Uh, not only were they able to do that, um, some of the kids actually were able to even add a moon. And the moon goes around the earth, and the earth goes around the sun. And all of that, uh, this particular student, a fourth grader, was able to do that with just 11 blocks of code. And if you look there, that's, that's his code. The moon looks like it's made of cheese, but uh, definitely he got the coding right, and you know, he did uh, make it all work. Another example. Now, uh, this was built by a fifth grader, so he had had some experience using Tinker. And everybody that I know uh, as a kid, they want to build games when they know programming. And so this particular student wanted to build the ever-famous Pac-Man. So this is his own version of Pac-Man. I mean, every time I look at this particular game, even though it's a really, really simple rendering of Pac-Man, uh, I really love it because uh, you know, I try to play with it at, on Tinker.com and it's always fun. I mean, it doesn't have scoring, it doesn't have all the lines and eating the points, but still, every time I play it, it's, it's really fun. And so whenever we see these kinds of creations by kids, we are really inspired. Now, another uh, aspect of what we see is that in terms of tinkerers, half of them are all girls. Uh, this particular example called Catch the Bamboo was built by a sixth grader from Cupertino. And as you can uh, see here, she's adding points, she's collecting all the uh, bamboo shoots and collecting the flowers. There's different kinds of points that she's adding. So it, it's pretty good. I mean, within a few days of tinkering, they get to this level. And in the middle school, things can get more and more complex and more creative. This was a math game built by a ninth grader. And he was a software internet tinker, and he decided to make something uh, that's not only fun, it uses the physics engine, but it also teaches something to the younger kids. So this basically exercises uh, math fact families. All you have to do is click on the bubbles, and uh, uh, you know, if they match, then you, know, you win and you go to the next level. So as you can see, these kinds of games are all really simple to build, because if you notice on the bottom, this particular game was built using less than 300 blocks of code. Uh, here I'm saying blocks of code, not lines of code, but it really is similar and it's the same thing because um, each block is like a line of code. All this sounds really easy and uh, it sounds as if uh, um, you know, you, um, kids, as soon as they see a visual programming language, they're able to do it. But this is what happened when we went to the classroom for the very first time. Uh, I think teachers in the audience will be able to relate to this, but uh, when I went for the first time to a classroom, uh, it was really eye-opening for me because you walk in and then 25 kids swarm into the lab and they all pick up their uh, you know, positions and they start logging in. And within about five minutes, everybody's out of sync. Uh, somebody's trying to log in, somebody else is asking, what is Tinker? Or somebody else is going into, you know, what is a browser? I mean, how do I get to this place anyway, right? And remember, these are all like third graders, they're fourth graders, and um, pretty soon uh, there are 10 hands up and the teacher has to answer all the questions. And we were scratching our heads and wondering, how do kids ever learn anything here? I mean, it's, it's such a chaotic experience, right? So we had to come back and we had to think as to how to implement a system that will make it uh, such that teachers can I actually teach computer science? 
And remember, teachers don't have formal computer science or computer programming background, right? I mean, most of the teachers that we were talking about were all third grade homeroom teachers and fifth grade science and math teachers, and they were really interested in teaching computer science and computer programming, but they didn't know how. So we built a system. So we built all kinds of tools for educators, classroom management, um, assessment tools, lesson plans. The way we solved the whole chaotic environment was that uh, we came up with this concept of a lesson module where kids would go watch something and they would watch an example and they would actually do an assignment based on that example. And we had a built-in tutor that everybody goes through. So it doesn't matter whether you are slow or you're fast, everybody would complete the project and then you would be able to experiment. About six months later, when we went back to the classroom and everything, uh, things were really good. And I'm happy to say that right now, thousands of schools use Tinker to teach kids programming and there are millions of kids' creations and close to a million actual game-like projects have been built by uh, kids using Tinker. I also wanted to share some of the cool tools that we have for uh, kids to use. So one of the things is a physics engine. Now, a simple thing like making a ball bounce is really not that easy to do in programming. Just imagine a ball has to bounce, so then you have to have physics equations for gravity. So the ball is accelerating, and you have to make sure that you model the right velocity at the right time. And then the ball drops to the ground, and it bounces, and there might be an angle that you need to work with. So there's some trig that you have to use. Um, hopefully not calculus, but at least you do have to use uh, some of those equations, and kids won't be able to figure that out. But with Tinker, it's one line of code to start uh, the, the physics engine, and another line of code to set up the gravity. Um, in this particular example, the gravity is sort of uh, really sort of smooth and less than Earth. Uh, it's set at six meters per second squared. So all of that is really easy to do in Tinker. And uh, in this particular example, to move the ball right or to the left, uh, you just apply an angular velocity using one more block of code. So kids are really good at experimenting with this. And this has been really popular uh, because uh, there are a lot of physics games like roller coasters and levels that they were built, all using this very simple concept of a physics engine. Uh, the other big thing is younger kids, they all want to do a lot of animation. And animation is uh, sort of really fun. It makes your programs interactive. But you know, it's not that easy to draw all these frames that you need. I mean, if you want to make a robot jump, I mean, maybe you need 10 frames of the robot saved in different sort of uh, uh, stop motion animation kind of frames. And it's not that easy to draw all that. So we have this character animation studio. And as you uh, can see from the example, the robot that was on the moon, uh, they're able to transform that to a mean looking mummy. He's a green space mummy. And with a few clicks, they're able to bring all of those frames back into the tool. And then they can make the mummy jump. And so that's exactly what they need, which is the, all the frames that you need for animation. And using that, then they have attack animations, defend poses, running, jumping, all kinds of things that they use to make their programs really interactive. One of the other cool things that uh, we did uh, were these coding puzzles. So in December of last year, uh, we built several of these immersive coding puzzles. So in this particular one that you see, it's a space puzzle. So there's Biff the spaceman, and there's a story, and he's lost in space, and he needs to get back to his moon base. When we make a story like that, it's really, really interesting for kids, because they love that whole intrigue and mystery, and they want to get into it. And with every level, you just have to uh, write a few lines of code to beat the level. And these kinds of puzzles we learned were really popular. We had more than 5 million kids using this, and most of them have never programmed before, but from the feedback that we got, this was something that was really popular and they loved it. One thing that we took back from that, maybe on the iPad, they could do it even better. And so we built an iPad app, and that iPad app has uh, 
uh, more of the same where you know the, there's a space animation and then there's also uh, turtle drawing and we are launching that app in the next couple of weeks and you'll be able to download that uh, from the app store now with that we are hoping to even lower the bar so that we can even get younger kids coding what's the meaning of all this right i mean so we can get kids to code that's great so why should you all learn to code and as i said right in the next few years you're all going to choose your careers and go and do bigger and better things uh, if there's one advice that i have to give you uh, it is to learn how to program, learn coding. You know, when I say programming, it ranges from building an iPhone app or, you know, having your own successful uh, business or even uh, building a web page, right? And it can be even really simple things like programming an Excel spreadsheet macro. All of these things are really important and all of these things will help you in whatever career you choose. So if there's one message I want to leave you with, it's to start coding today. And you can try it on Tinker if you want to, or you can try it on any other website which allows you to do so. And uh, best of luck. Thank you.